<laughs> Good morning, everybody. We're trying to get situated here this morning. How's everybody doing? There's Gretchen. I see Lisa. I see Tiffany. We are recording this morning. How's everybody doing? Come on, please. Good morning. Cough and fit over here. All right. So can y'all hear me okay online? Yes. Excellent. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to projection here. Y'all let me know if you can see the screen in a moment. Still learning how to do all this stuff. Got to put on my eyeballs. Okay, share screen. All right, can you see my slide? No. No. Oh, now that? it's think it's think there we go. Now we're good. Excellent. Okay. So we're doing a big push right now with um, really the whole year here at church is going to be a, a discipleship and education push. And so, of course, education, now we're falling into one of my very exciting categories. And so I wanted to make sure that you knew a couple of things this morning. Number one, that we as a church are in complete alignment. So what that means is our small groups, our adult Bible fellowship, and in Sunday morning church, we're all going to be pushing the same thing. Now, you may not be thinking so because Jesse is in this middle of a, of a sermon series on the book of Mark. But if you've seen any of the advertising, the, the pictures and things that we're doing for the book of Mark, Mark is considered the discipleship gospel. So one of the big things that we've said again and again is that Mark is put together differently than the rest of the gospels. Uh, in most of the other gospels, when you're looking at how it's put together, it talks about the birth of Jesus, and then it goes into the ministry of Jesus, focusing more on what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is teaching. And that is, this, that is pretty much the case for Matthew and Luke and then John. John focuses even more on the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is working throughout Jesus's ministry. So if you decided as a new believer to start reading the Bible, you would not start with John. It would not be recommended to start with John just because it's more heady. It's more ethereal. It's, it's kind of harder to grasp what Jesus actually was about as he was doing his ministry here on the earth. But Mark, the way that it's put together, it focuses more on the things that Jesus did. It focused on his actions and it focused on his interaction with people. So that's why it's called the discipleship gospel. All right. So one of the things that I said yesterday in, uh, on Facebook and then also in my invitation for y'all to be here this morning, that we're going to be talking about disciple shift. I don't know if y'all caught that. Yeah, disciple shift. Because how discipleship has been defined over the years in churches. And I know talking to all of y'all, pretty much all of you grew up in the church and all of you have been, for the most part, involved in evangelical churches. And what I mean by evangelical churches, it's churches whose business is to go out and reach the people and bring them into the church. Now, the other kinds of churches are called liturgical churches. Liturgical churches are put together differently. There's not a push to go out and bring people in. 
the way litig liturgical churches are put together, they've got a liturgy, which is a set way of doing things. And that's the way it's going to be all the time. There's even going to be a schedule of what scripture readings are going to be done every Sunday, every year from now until Jesus comes back. And if you want to be part of that church, you can just pop in and join the church. They may have some different things that you have to do in order to meet their requirements, but you just pop in and join. That's different than evangelical churches. And what's happened over the years is in evangelical churches, they've gotten into this habit of on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and on Wednesday, we do church. And everybody who's supposed to come, comes. And then every once in a while, we have this push on evangelism. We'll have a revival service. Or we'll do door-to-door -door evangelism where we do visitations or we... We, what's that called when you go knocking on strangers' doors? <laughs> Witness, not witnessing. It's different. It's a program. We did it in First Baptist Church a lot of times. They give you little, little door hangers if you missed them and you got to put them on there, inviting them to church and everything. But the point is, it hasn't remained a this is what we're all about. Instead, it's turned into a special program a special emphasis that's not what's happening every day, all day for all believers. What's even worse is when a church gets this mindset that evangelism is up to the pastor. We come to the church, we do our thing, we raise our hands, sing our songs, listen to a sermon and say, ooh, that stepped on my toes. And then we walk out of the church and we're done. The next time we do church is next Sunday when we show up again. And any evangelism then is left up to the pastor. It's up to the pastor to go visit the sick. It's up to the pastor to do the funerals. It's up to the pastor to witness to the lost. And everybody else just gets served instead of serving. So what I wanted to share with you today, just this is, this is a, a one-off kind of lesson is what is true discipleship so a lot of these screens as I take you through them I'm going to stop and just ask you what are your impressions what do you think of this of this scripture or what do you think of this statement so be ready for that all right so the discipleship process there is a process and the process begins even before we're believers there are no shortcuts to this process. So the first thing is that you must be born again. The scripture I have here is Ephesians chapter two, verse one. And if you go all the way through chapter two, you'll see that there is a good description of what we are like before we have Jesus. So this is verses one through uh, verses two and three. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So these kind of people we call the lost, okay? And everybody since Adam is born lost. So what this means is that everybody starts at the same place, completely undeserving of the love of God, completely unknowing of who Jesus is. And what happens is over time, we start to learn things. Now, if you're raised in a Christian home, you're going to be learning the difference between right and wrong. You're going to be learning that if you do wrong, there is punishment. If you do right, there is reward. But there's still a disconnect 
because what you're doing is you're learning how to act right but you're not learning how to be right so even if you raised a good kid to the point where everybody can look at you from the outside and say that's a good person they've got their stuff together well that may or may not be true you may have learned how to act right and fool the world the world but still inside of you is dirty and sinful and missing the one key that can make everything all right and that key of course is jesus so the lost person finds jesus and they may or may not look any different on the outside they may or may not act any different on the outside but on the inside there is a big change. What's the big change? Or you know, well, I was going to just say that it's one of my favorite things, and we mentioned this before. You know, there are a lot of uh, good men who are Christian. Yes. And there are a lot of Christians who are good men. Right. And, you know, it just, it just yeah. You, know, you cannot worship God unless you're born again. Absolutely. You, cannot. you can go through the more motions, and that's and that's what I really wanted to talk about. Cannot worship God. You can go through the motions, you can appear that you're worshiping God. You can raise your hands, you can say all the right words. But inside, if you are not saved, if you do not have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, regardless of how you act, regardless of what you say, there's no brownie points. <laughs> in God's eyes, there are no brownie points. You know, Absolutely. When, when you when you commit yourself or when you submit yourself, uh, you know, there's so many different ways. You know, a lot of people can say, well, I was saved on December the second, whatever. Right, their second birth date. You know, and then and then uh and I think in my case it was a little different because you know there was something that snapped or clicked or whatever when I was a little kid in Sunday school and I was never taught about Jesus about Jesus. And I can't say that anything happened on any particular day, but Jesus came to me. There was something that appealed to me about the way my mother, my grandparents told me. Yeah, and so it was one of this world thing. And out of that came this uh, easy to read, receive thing that was that the five that was seems to be talking about. And uh, you know, when I said I believe this, I told it to myself. But with the public commitment at that time, you know, I was except all over the right, right. But you know, there was something that just happened, and I know it happened. So, it, you know, we all do these things in different ways, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah that didn't happen to me until I was 17. You can be fooled by what you see, too, because it, it goes back like with the fruits of the Spirit. Is it something you do, or is it something that you have? Right. And you the difference be between both. a carnal person and a believer is that you can act out the fruit of the spirit but you don't have the fruit of the spirit and another thing too let's say you're having a bad day and you're not so feeling so fruity and you cut somebody out <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? you, all you gotta do is renew your mind yes yeah it's not it's not something it's something that you have in you, you right have right you just renew your mind right so okay so now we know that we need to have jesus so we receive jesus and all of a sudden we're billy graham right no no the next step is that we are spiritual babies okay and this is regardless of what age you get saved i mean if you're four and you really know the difference between sin and you need god you can get saved at four it may be somebody who's 40, where it took them that long to figure out that there is a difference between acting right for God and being right 
with God. Ooh, I need to write that down. Yeah, that's, a good one. that's pretty good. So look at John 3. John 3, starting in verse 3. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So as spiritual babes, the Holy Spirit pulls you to Christ. You accept Christ. And at this point, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. I love that word, dwell. It's a cool word. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit comes and, and you know, visits. To dwell means makes himself at home. The Holy Spirit makes himself at home and will never leave you, never forsake you. Now with the Holy Spirit inside, it's kind of like a hoarder who has the intervention and now all of the junk has been cleaned out, but the problem with a hoarder is that they've got a tendency to hoard. And without oversight, what happens? They start hoarding again. So you see these hoarder TV shows, right? And somebody comes in, cleans out their house. They've got a psychologist or somebody that talks with them. And then the show ends. And maybe every once in a while, they'll give you a little, you know, six months later, the house is already full of trash again. Well, what's the difference? Well, the psychologist did not stay with them. The psychologist did not continue to treat them and they fell back into their old ways. As a believer, the Holy Spirit comes to you, dwells in you, which means he's there to stay. So now when you want, when you want to go back to your old ways, you go back to those old sins that you used to commit. Now you got the Holy Spirit going, hey, hey, that's the stuff that I talked about before. You need to stop doing that. And then that's called conviction. And then you repent, get cleansed with 1 John 1, 9. And you're like, okay, I'm right with God again. And then sin comes back again. And the Holy Spirit says, hey. This is that stuff again. Oh, sorry, I did it again. But the difference now is that you've got somebody with you all the time reminding you, you can't go back. That's not the way. I am the way. It, well, it, it's like an attitude adjustment. It, it goes back as, you, as you're being a Christian, you're not really under the law anymore, but are you under the law? It's yes and not no and yes. It's like Matthew chapter five, They're like looking with your eyes. It's more of an attitude. You know what I mean? You, 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 you know, when you look at somebody, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Look at, what's the other one? Looking at somebody. So it's, it's the whole thing about brother. thinking bad thoughts it's about attitude. somebody and, and it's all it's attitude. attitude where now it's not actions you're being judged yeah, by. It's, yeah. It's, it's not your actions you're being judged by anymore. It's your attitudes that you're yeah. being judged by. So the, the thing is, though, is as a spiritual baby, the Holy Spirit's going to be working on you hard because you're wanting to keep on in the old way. And the Holy Spirit is going to be reminding you again and again and again and again, you can't go that way anymore. But as you mature, the amount of intervention that the Holy Spirit has to pull on you becomes less and less and less. And you know, after you, after you reach a certain point and you continue to grow in God and grow and grow in his word, the blessings start to come. 
Yeah, that's true. You're going to get blessings early on. But what happens is as you get more mature in the Lord, the, the big things aren't a problem anymore. And now the little things become more important. And those little things are the ones that give you the most blessings. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. That's what happens. Now, as you mature, you become a spiritual child. You're not a spiritual baby anymore. You're a spiritual child. So Galatians 4, 19 and 20, my dear children. Okay, now this isn't my dear babies. My dear children, Paul says for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Wait a minute. This is different. These are believers. And now he's talking again about Christ being formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. What's Paul telling the Galatians here? What's he saying? Take it apart, my dear children. So what does that say about the Galatians? They are believers, but they are not mature. Okay, they are believers. And then he says, I'm again in the pains of childbirth. Because you're growing. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. He's saying you should be growing and you're not. It's like I'm having to start all over with you again. They don't know how to act. Basically, he's saying, you are old enough to know better. And they're not acting the way a mature Christian should. So they're not babies just converted into the faith, but they're definitely not adults in the Lord yet. They're still acting like babies, even though he should, they should be children, okay, at this point. You know, I wonder, you know, uh, whether, you know, Somewhere along the lines of maturity, maturity doesn't happen to the problem. Maybe. So anyway, I, I always wondered, you know, the crowns in heaven that wait for us, you know, are there more or less crowns for the immature or the yes. more mature? Yes. yes. No, and there's I, more I jewels in the crowns. That. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. All right. So then we reach spiritual young adulthood. Okay. First John 2, 14, I write to you, dear children, different word in the Greek than what he used before in Galatians, because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know who, him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you're strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. So now we've gotten from the point where we must be born again to the point where we need constant guidance like babies to the point where we're self-focused, we're still immature, we're believers, and we're moving along the right path. And like Orville said, some faster than others to the point where eventually we reach young adulthood. How old do you have to be as a Christian to be young adult Christian? Trick question. Yeah, there's no, there's no age. You might have one person who they get saved at 17 and they reach young adulthood like immediately because they, they just mature faster in the Lord than others. Right. Then you've got other people who think Christianity, even after getting saved, is about the rules. And if they're just living by the rules, they're not going to grow because they're busy checking off a checklist instead of really having relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it's in the relationship that the growth happens, okay? All right, next, we reach the point where we are a spiritual parent. This is a disciple maker. 1 Corinthians 4.15, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. So what's Paul talking about here to the Corinthians? What do you think? All right, you're thinking too hard. I don't want the Sunday school answer here. Okay, 
So Paul was the one that went to Corinth to a bunch of heathen non-believers and through preaching the gospel, converted them to Christianity because he was the one that spread the word to them. He always felt extra close to them because he was their spiritual father. He was the one that led them to the Lord. Now we can get all churchy and say it's the Holy Spirit who does the work. Yes, that's true. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying you may have a bunch of people that taught you Christian things along the way, but there's only one person that led you to the Lord. I am him. Okay, so this is the category of being a disciple maker. You leading someone else to the Lord is what takes you from a spiritual young adult to a spiritual adult. Now, it is sad to say, but the vast majority of believers never make it here. Does that make them any less a believer? No, you're still saved. You're still going to heaven. But when you get to heaven, your crown's going to be missing a jewel. Okay, back to Orville. Okay, that jewel that you're going to be missing is the disciple maker jewel. One of the things that God wants you to do is to lead someone to the Lord. Now you're getting scared because everybody has this fear that's in them. And this is everyone. Everyone has this fear. How do I do that? What if I don't say the right word? What if I, what if I tell them they're saved, but they're really not? And then they've got this false security and they're still going to go to hell. And yeah, oh, 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 and you get all concerned about, did I do it right? But understand that all you can do is lead someone to the Lord. It's kind of like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. They've got to be able to take that step to get it from head knowledge to heart knowledge. I know I've witnessed a lot. Right. Okay. And, and I've always, so you just gave me something to do. I've always believed and thought that the Lord gave me the words to say. He does. To get there. He does. The right words for each individual. He does. To believe. And I've brought people to the Lord. But it is always, I've always said, thank you for opening their hearts because I couldn't do that. So I didn't give you anything new. What you said okay. is exactly the way it's okay. supposed to be. Okay. That, and that's, that's the way I That's the way it's supposed, it's supposed to be. Okay. So, oh, back up, Sorry. back up, back up. All right. So one thing that you have to understand, though, is that some people are really good at sealing the deal, where they take the person and they cross them over the great divide between being an unbeliever and a believer. Other people aren't, they don't have that gifting. Some people are good at plowing where they just have the right words to say to make someone realize they're not right with God. Other people are good at planting where a person's already been plowed and you might be that hope giver. The person that comes in and says, you know, you look like you're really broken. You know, just trust in the Lord. And that may be all you say to a person that hasn't been plowed. That won't mean anything. But to someone who's had the Holy Spirit plowing in them already, just trust in the Lord might be the only word they need to hear. And their simple prayer is, God, they're right. I haven't trusted you. I trust you now. And they're just as saved as someone who walked down the aisle and broke down crying in front of God and everybody. Other people can take it all the way to the finish line, but understand that when Paul was teaching, and I can't remember the passage, I think I have it later in this, in this scripture, uh, later in my slide deck here, but it's like people were saying, well, I follow Paul. And someone says, well, I follow Apollos. And another person says, oh, well, I follow Jesus. And they're doing this one upsmanship on who's the best teacher. And what Paul teaches them is, no, they're all good teachers. Without the Holy Spirit, you have nobody. And so each 
person, each of you, each of us have a different role to play in, the, in this discipleship process that we have here, okay? And it just might not be your role to pray the sinner's prayer with somebody. But that doesn't mean you did not take part in their evangelism or in their discipleship. Okay, so the next step, and this is a very rare group of Christians, and these are spiritual grandparents. This is our push at Two Rivers this year to teach all of you how to be spiritual grandparents. Now, before you become a spiritual grandparent, you have to be a spiritual parent, okay? So first, our second Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. You've got me teaching you, you have to teach others so they in turn may go teach more. We're talking four generations of teaching just in this one verse. You heard me tell you, now you need to tell it to somebody else so they can share it with even more people. That's what it is to be a spiritual grandparent. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the, the one thing that always in church with you or any you know you're supposed to separate yourself from unbelievers and from all of that and I said no yeah because how can you witness to them? that's a churchy rule not yeah, a god rule I know and I was like how can you witness to people if you're only with believers right and people didn't have an answer to that so I can you tell that salt is salty if it's in the salt shaker yeah and so no no and so it's like putting myself out there with people that I'm uncomfortable with to be able to be in the right position to witness. Right. And that's, and that's part. part of what Jesse was teaching last Sunday and last Sunday's sermon, the idea of a Matthew party. And that was when Jesus called Levi to be a follower, the first thing that Levi, Matthew, did was put together a party. And who was at the party? It was all of the other sinners and tax collectors, all of the people that Jesus and his disciples got called on the carpet by the religious establishment of mingling with or for mingling with. We are supposed to get in the trenches, which means we are going to get dirt on us, which is why God gives us 1 John 1, 9, which gives us the opportunity to confess our sins daily because we know that he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's our spiritual bar of soap that we need to be using every day because God expects us to go and get dirty, but then he expects us to clean up to get ready for the next day. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, I think as time goes by, God blesses you with uh, uh, something like uh, an open heart, an open mind, appreciation for who people are. Uh, you, know, you can't in the least pass judgment. You know, because when you see people, because you don't know. Uh, you don't know. And I think about, you know, I know, I've known, and I'm not a very good witness. Uh, I'd be more in the category of maybe <laughs> somebody who you might encourage. Right, and encourage you're good, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've known people who have committed murder, killed people, who have robbed places, and people who are plain as a pin. But, you know, uh, it's a matter of understanding the future of that person for who he is and where he came from, you know. Uh, well, you're a special person because usually what happens is people get older, they become less tolerant and more judgmental. And so that, that makes you a very special person. If now, as you are, as you are, are maturing, 
you are seeing past the things people did and able to look more at the heart of them. That makes you a very special person. Well, I look at what's inside. I try to always look at what's inside people, not what's outside. We try. Outside, outside is nothing. Yeah, we try. All right, let's continue. So there's a couple of words that we need to, that we see in scripture, and we need to notice that there is a difference between these words. There's a word that's been described or translated to us as learner or apprentice, and the Greek word is mathetes. And this mathetes word is usually applied to Pharisees, zealots, disciples of various people. They would follow, they would memorize the teachings, they would learn methods, they would imitate the teacher and reproduce what they had learned. So this is who Jesse was talking about, how you became a rabbi. So everybody got some level of general teaching when they were little. If they showed an aptitude to those spiritual teachings, then they were encouraged to go to like a finishing school where they would learn more about certain teachers of the law. And as they grew up in those schools, then they would move into the point of either being a scribe or a Sadducee or a Pharisee, or maybe even a rabbi. Those levels of religiously schooled people would always refer back to their training. They would say, Rabbi so-and-so taught us this. And if you're a good follower, then you would be known by what your teacher said, okay? Um, when, when I come across people here in Gonzales being a small town, I come across people who would say, well, in my chemistry class, I learned, and I'm like, oh, you must have had Mr. Crumb. That was a different chemistry teacher than me, okay? I know my students because I taught them a certain way and they continue in that way. Mr. Crumb taught a different way and his students worked in that way. So now that teaching style is, is still able to be picked up by the way they were taught. That's this word, a learner or an apprentice. If you're apprenticing yourself to someone, what are you learning? Nothing. Everything. Yeah. You're learning exactly how to do everything that they do exactly the way that they do it, okay? I've got my own sound back, back in track today. Side. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's a song. I'm like, <laughs> I have my own soundtrack behind me wow. today. All right. So an apprentice, though, is basically just a copycat. That's all it is, a copycat. In Jesus's day, it was very common for teachers to have apprentices come and attach themselves to them. And they just talk and taught and everything they did all day long, every day. There is a Monty Python movie called The Life of Brian. It's pretty sacrilegious. Uh, it is funny, but it's, it's, it's not, not very Christian-like. Um, the, the thing that they did get right, though, is they show Jesus on the hillside, Mount of Olives, and he's teaching the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, and the camera is backing away from him as he's teaching. And so you see all of the crowds that have gathered around him. And as you go further back, you start to see other hillsides in the background. And each of those hillsides have a teacher on it with thousands of people listening to them. It's meant to be a joke, but they actually got it right. That's how it was done back in those days. There wasn't a classroom that kids came to the classroom and then rotated out of your class into somebody else's classroom. What happened is you attach yourself to a teacher and you will follow that teacher around until either they release you, meaning now you know everything that you need to know and are good to go proclaim that same word to someone else, or they say something that you don't agree with and you leave and attach yourself to another teacher. That's how it was done. Even in Jesus's, Jesus himself with his disciples, his apostles, but also all the other rabbis, they all had these learners that were attached to them. So 
What God wants us to be, though, is this different Greek word, and it's akolauteo. This word is where we get today's word acolyte, okay? 1 Timothy 4, 6, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. 2 Timothy 1, 13, follow the pattern of the sound words you have heard from me with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So a follower. What do you think the difference is between a follower and a learner? What's the difference between a follower and a learner? I follow someone, I really follow and take it in, and I'm able to use it in my everyday life and and keep it there. It doesn't go away. Right. Does that make sense? Application. Yep. It's application. Application. So a learner keeps everything here. Right here. A follower keeps everything here. Okay. So what God wants us to be is more than just knowing his word. What's the scripture? Be not hearers of the word, but be doers also. You can hear it too when some of them talk, they get frustrated. And you'll hear them say, I, I can't do this. I, I, I can't do this. You know what I mean? And it's, and it was, it's like, you, you don't understand what you've got is a free gift yet and you're trying to do something that he already gave you yeah you just live it yeah and that's again that distance between head and heart and that's a hard road to travel really taking something from hearing it and learning it and turning it into something that makes you who you are well it comes from an understanding of who you are in christ right and not trying to do something i got it i got to do this I gotta, and that's the difference between being a spiritual child and being a spiritual young adult. I see, I see the difference. And you know, uh, the, you know, Sync has connected to your phone and is reminding you that 911 assist is set to up. Just saying, because it's not in his program, but in his program that he got put into him or a chip or something like that. But it's more where the spirit that lets you, that's the word with application, right? Let you use those things out of your natural right. being. Right. Goes, and that goes, comes with maturity. And it goes back to the law, too. I mean, it's not like you're not trying to keep the law. You don't, you don't let it cross your mind, but you're inadvertently doing it anyway without even trying. Right. Yeah. Let's look at some scripture here. So key elements of a follower. So following God means to trust and obey. We get that out of Joshua 14.8. Following means to obey the word, commandments, and sound doctrine. And we see that in Deuteronomy, 2 John, 1 Timothy. Following means identification with Jesus and putting family and income second. That's a hard one. Following means sharing Christ's life, ministry, and sacrifice. Following means having a relationship with Jesus care and intimate teaching and following means imitation so our, if those of y'all that are doing your your daily bible reading uh you should be around acts chapter 10 acts chapter 11 right now if you're following that plan and in acts chapter 11 is where we see that the term christian was first used 
in the town of Antioch. And the reason that they used the word Christians to describe the followers of the way, it was a derogatory term. They made fun of these followers of the way and called them little Christs, these little mini-me's that are running around, little Christs. So that's the picture that comes along with that word Christian. So that's why I made that post on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. If you call yourself a Christian, you should at least be trying to live up to the name. <laughs> I didn't see that, but that's good. Okay. So, because there's some, some people, they call themselves Christians, and the way they live their life every day is not indicative of Christ. Okay. So, a disciple is a person who is following Christ, using your head, is being changed by Christ using their heart, and is committed to the mission of Christ, which is using their hands. So to be a disciple, that means you're not just sitting and learning, but you're also figuring out how to apply it to your life and then how to put it to action. In order to be a disciple, you have to use your head and your heart and your hands. Can you be a Christian and not be active in the church? Yes, you can. Absolutely. So I'm not saying anything about, are you saved? You have to prove you're being saved by being active. I'm not saying that at all. I am assuming that you're already a believer. But now you have to go on to the next step. To mature in Christ means you're not just a learner anymore. Now you're going to be an applier and a doer okay so i'm not even halfway through my slide deck which means i get to use the second half of this next week so it's already about 10 after six and so i'm going to go ahead and stop i'll pick up here six after ten six after ten not ten after six six after ten so i'll go ahead and stop right here and then we'll pick up here for next week so does anybody have any questions or anything else they'd like to add any of our at home audience No. I'm good. I'm good. That's I'm good. good. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording then if I can figure out how. I never know how. Right. That's what has sustained me and helped me through a lot. Is that he's always there. Absolutely. He's always a part of my life. And he tends to bring people. They just kind of gravitate and help them out by bringing them to God. 